I'm Americ Bixo with Advanced Nutrients, and I'm here to give you tips that can give you bigger and stickier buds. The thing to start is with good genetics. You can either go with clones or with seeds, obviously. So some of the advantages, again, of clones is basically consistency. You have known stock, whereas seeds, you're sort of rolling the genetic dice a little bit, but you're also not inheriting any problems. Sometimes when we get clones, especially clone-only strains that have been passed around for decades, there can be problems laying beneath the surface of that plant leaf that you might not even see. For example, powdery mildew can originate from inside the plant. Whereas with seeds, you're starting insect-free, typically disease-free, viruses aren't passed on to the seeds. So each has their advantages, but uh, if you're willing to take a little bit of time and patience in the selection process, I would recommend going with seeds. And so number two in getting bigger yields and stickier buds is keeping the right environment for the uh, genetics you've selected. Uh, so, so take the time to do the research. There's some great books on the subject of different land races of cannabis and therefore the different climates they're accustomed to. I'm a big fan of uh, Robert Cannell Clark and uh, Michael Stark. Um, you know, for example, if, if you want to grow um, something like an OG Kush, it's ideal that you're able to actually lower the temperatures and so on and so forth towards ripening. You're actually going to get the best properties out of that particular strain just because of where it originates from. It's used to colder nights and kind of a harsher environment. And, and, and this is why I'd like to raise uh, the, uh, the topic of CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, where basically every growing parameter in the room is controlled. It takes a little more budget, takes a little more know-how to set it up, but it can be a lot more rewarding. In this case, you're using an air conditioner to main temperatures because you're not exhausting the warm air up. The air conditioner also will play a role in dehumidifying the air as all the plants are going to transpire moisture. Um, you'll also need a dehumidifier for during the dark cycle when your air conditioner is typically not running and that will take care of the nighttime humidity. It won't cycle too often and the RO water can actually be treated and used for watering plants. So in essence, you can, you can recapture the water being lost by plants and feed it back to them. Uh, you'll also need a uh, carbon scrubber operating 24-7. A lot of you may be using carbon scrubbers in your exhaust, sending the air outside to remove any mold spores, odors, and, and problems like that. So in a controlled environment agriculture room, this is keeping the air purified at all times. Um, you'll also need to add carbon dioxide in this type of environment because you're not drawing outside air in. So a gas-fired CO2 generator is your best bet, especially for anything of any kind of scale, like over a 10 by 10 room. Uh, for example, there's the uh, Cool Flame CO2 maximizer, and I believe there's a Hydrogen, that's another one. And they can significantly reduce the amount of heat you're introducing to the grow room. Bigger roots for bigger fruits. And Basically, the root system of a plant is supporting the upper portion, obviously. Roots uh, also produce naturally occurring growth hormones that the green parts and flowering parts of the plant are going to use, uh, namely cytokinins. So the bigger a root system you can develop, the plant will also have a higher hormonal content of cytokinins that can be sent into the upper portion, which in return, the green parts of the plant produce auxins that go back down to the roots and uh, encourage further root growth. So it's a push-pull relationship. One of the easiest ways and most effective ways to do this, as well as to improve the plant's natural resistance to diseases, root diseases and other problems, is to inoculate it with beneficial bacteria and fungi. Uh, things like trichoderma, mycorrhizae, bacillus. And there's even some super strains of bacteria too that are developed in, in overseas labs specifically for cannabis horticulture. Uh, some of these products include tarantula, voodoo juice, piranha from advanced nutrients. I've seen uh, through our research facilities the, the pronounced effects these can have uh, often within days, e even within 24, 48 hours of application, you can see a significantly bigger root system. And some of these bacteria and fungi help to fight off root disease and other pathogens that can harm your crop. But they also produce naturally occurring growth hormones, for example, like cytokinins, which I mentioned earlier. Um, 
and can contribute to the overall quality of your crop, yield, and of course, have a big impact on disease resistance. Because good medicine is clean medicine, and that becomes especially important when you have large, dense colas ripening in the later phases. So by inoculating the plants early, keeping them resistant, you're significantly increasing your chances of harvesting a higher quality crop. Number four, lighting for crops. Now, there's a lot of information out there on, on lighting for indoor cannabis crops. There's uh, quite a few different technologies that can be used to do it. Um, there's three basic ones that I would consider. And the first one would be fluorescence, which would include things like T5s and CFLs, compact fluorescent lighting. And then you move into the high intensity discharge category, which includes high pressure sodium, metal halide. Uh, these are probably most common for growers serious about producing um, significant yields and higher rates of quality. Uh, and now we have LEDs on the scene too, light emitting diodes. And some of the earlier technologies I think were best reserved for maybe mother plants, maybe a little bit of vegetative growth. But now with, uh, with the research that's been done, the feedback that's come in, and also just the fact that this technology is growing leaps and bounds, um, I think it's quite probable that maybe in the next five to 10 years, we actually might see LEDs replacing more and more HPS and metal halide lights. Now, the ones that seem to work best on the feedback and research that um, I've had come across are the ones that have more than just the red and the blue diodes. A little bit of orange in there and a little bit of white or UV diodes is what I'd recommend if you're shopping around for an LED. Now, of course, everything's got its advantages and disadvantages. The thing with fluorescent lights I often hear is, well, I just want to do a hobby garden, so I'm going to use some T5s because they run cool and, and I don't need to worry about exhausting. That's not exactly true. These T5 fixtures, um, they do run a little bit cooler than HIDs watt for watt because they are actually more efficient at converting electricity into usable light. However, they're just spreading the heat out over a larger surface area. That fixture is two feet by four feet roughly, whereas a high pressure sodium bulb, for example, a 400 watt is maybe six inches diameter by you know, eight inches long. So it's just that the heat source is being spread out over water. And you could quickly see this if you were to plug in uh, you know, an eight lamp two by four T5 in a, in a hydro hut and, and not have an exhaust fan running. It would get stifling hot very quick in there. So that's something to keep in mind if you're shopping around for a beginner type garden is, is T5s can be fairly productive. Uh, same with CFLs. What you're gonna need to do is keep your plants a little bit shorter or trimmed at the bottom because basically the top 16 inches of that plant is gonna be quality material. While fluorescent lighting produces a very rich spectrum, uh, it's got what you would call a high photon flux density, meaning there's a lot of usable plant light in there the intensity diminishes very quickly with the distance it travels compared to high intensity discharge lighting. So HIDs have typically been uh, the best choice for, for more serious growers or if you want to grow bigger, taller plants. Um, however, they're not the most efficient technology in terms of the amount of heat they produce. They produce about an equal amount of heat relative to the light energy. And something has to be done with this heat. If it's run in a closed environment without an exhaust fan or an air conditioner, it's gonna cook the plants in a matter of hours. So while they produce very bright light, there's a lot of heat that needs to be managed. Um, Air-cooled reflectors are a great way to do this because they seal off the lamp from the growing environment and exhaust the heat away before it ever has a chance to really reach the garden. There's also water-cooled lighting. It's a little bit trickier to set up, a little bit more uh, expense as well. However, you can maintain uh, near ambient temperatures running with water-cooled. Now, LEDs emit virtually no heat. Uh, it's, it's actually quite remarkable how little heat they produce. And one of the big advantages to this, even if one person were to argue that maybe they're not as intense or uh, maybe they're not as rich in spectrum as, as fluorescence or HIDs. The fact that they produce very little heat allows you to run carbon dioxide extremely effectively in the environment. Your exhaust fans don't need to cycle to discharge the heat. So you can use CO2 very efficiently out of a tank or even using fermentation. 
Uh, in a sealed environment with LEDs, I've been able to measure um, up to 2,800 parts per million of carbon dioxide being produced by the primary fermentation of beer. So if you like beer or wine, it's a good way to boost up your CO2, get some LEDs, get some bigger yields.